Okay, so everyone is talking about the rescue mission to find the missing submersible that vanished on Sunday morning while it was exploring the depths of the Atlantic Ocean as a part of a once in a lifetime experience to gaze at the wreckage of the Titanic. On board was British billionaire and owner of Action Aviation, Hamish Harding, along with prominent Pakistani businessman Shazada Dawood and his son Suleiman, and 77 year old French explorer Paul Henry Najliet, as well as Stockton Rush, the chief executive officer of Ocean Gate, the firm that is behind the a dive. There are now less than 24 hours of oxygen left in the missing Titan submersible as rescue efforts continue. As the time ticks on, the rescue mission gets more and more dire. So far, we've only had one positive update that came in this morning. A Canadian aircraft searching for the vessel detected intermittent banging noises from the vicinity of its last known location. Apparently, the crew heard banging sounds every 30 minutes on Tuesday and again four hours later. Though we don't know if that same noise has continued or what could have caused it. It is still a positive sign under these horrific circumstances. The vessel submerged on Sunday morning from its support vessel to travel to the Titanic wreckage, which sits at a depth of 12,500 feet. About an hour and 45 minutes later, the Titan lost contact with its mothership, the Polar Prince. It only takes about eight hours to complete the entire trip, including a two hour descent and exploration. So when the craft failed to surface on Sunday afternoon, it was clear that something had gone horribly wrong. Experts have said that they should have been sending a signal out every few minutes, so the fact that there has been radio silence is very worrying. The Titan is equipped with a four-day emergency oxygen supply, though it's estimated that the five missing passengers have less than 24 hours left. And the reality is terrifying. Five men trapped inside a tiny 22-foot tube with a single window and no seats, thousands of feet below sea level with no way of reaching the outside world. They will be dealing with cramped conditions and after a while claustrophobia, or while not being able to see beyond the black depths of the ocean from the single window. Add to that the dwindling supply of oxygen and the risk of hypothermia. Of course, at this point, there are very few options for what could have happened. It could be floating on the surface of the water, meaning it would be easier for rescue crews to locate the submarine before their air runs out. It is also possible that they are stuck within the actual wreckage of the Titanic. In that case, the rescue would be very difficult because they are still thousands of feet under the sea and the technology required to save them doesn't actually exist yet. The third scenario is sadly implosion, which has not been ruled out. If the hull collapses under the enormous pressure, then the chances of survival are zero. Since the incident first made headlines, so much has come out about the company OceanGate, which makes you question the voyage even more. According to one of their blog posts in 2019, they revealed that Titan wasn't even classed using industry standards because its technology was so new and it falls outside of the existing paradigm. OceanGate said that while classing has a safety value, it's not sufficient to ensure safety. A part of this innovative design is the fact that it's literally operated by a video game controller, which connects to the vessel through Bluetooth. This is by far the most unbelievable part of the story. Game controllers are sometimes used by pilots controlling drones, as well as in medical training. But to think it's the only way to control this submersible 12,000 feet below the water is shocking. What's even more troubling is the reports that have come out since the story broke. David Pogue, a CBS News correspondent, was involved in the exact same expedition last year with the Titan, and he revealed something pretty shocking. Apparently on his trip, the vessel got lost on the sea floor for a few hours while they were visiting the Titanic's resting place. He tweeted, on my expedition last summer, they did indeed get lost for about five hours. David wasn't in the submersible himself, but he was in a control room on a ship at the surface at the time. Although unlike this one that went missing, the one last year's never actually lost communication with its mothership. He said, they could still send a short text to the sub, but did not know where it was. It was quiet and very tense, and they shut off the ship's internet to prevent us from tweeting. The company claimed that this was all to keep the channels open in case of a serious emergency. Leading this current search is the US Coast Guard Admiral John Morga, who spoke to CBS Mornings about the rescue mission. He said, this is an incredibly complex case. As long as there is an opportunity for survival, we will continue to work and bring every resource to bear on the search. He also confirmed that authorities are deploying more vessels in the search, and at the moment they have an aircraft flying above the water surface. There is still some hope left, though it's a race against the clock, because the air supply is expected to run out tomorrow at around 6 a.m. Hopes are quickly fading for the survival of the crew of the Titan. One of their last chances at success involves a French robot that can dive 20,000 feet underwater. It's currently on its way to help find the tourist submersible that vanished on the expedition to the Titanic wreck. This could help free the sub if it's trapped inside the wreckage. 
although it does not have the power to pull the vessel up to the surface. The robot is called Victor 6000 and it can dive deeper than any other equipment now at the site in the North Atlantic. It has arms that can be remotely controlled to cut cables and do other things to try to release a stuck vessel. It arrived late last night which gave it a limited window to try to find them before the Thursday morning deadline when their oxygen supply was expected to run out. The operators confirmed that Victor is not capable of lifting the submarine up on its own but they said that it could help hook tight into a ship with the capacity to lift it to the surface. The robot has strong lights allowing it to see through some of the murk at such depths but experts warned that the rescuers would need to know fairly precisely where to look for Titan which they just haven't been able to do. Unfortunately even if the search teams do find the submersible a rescue operation would take up precious time. As we know the vessel went missing with five people on board shortly after starting its descent on Sunday morning. The passengers each paid a whopping $250,000 to seek out and explore the wreckage of the Titanic, a place few have gone before. The ship lies at a depth of 12,500 feet below the sea, making it inaccessible to those without a certain type of submarine. On board was British billionaire and owner of action aviation Hamish Harding, along with prominent Pakistani businessman Shazada Dawood and his son Suleiman, along with 77-year-old French explorer Paul Henry and Stockton Rush, the chief executive officer of OceanGate, which is the firm behind the dive. A massive search operation in the Atlantic Ocean is now underway in an area twice the size of Connecticut. A glimmer of hope came on Tuesday and Wednesday morning when banging noises were identified by a Canadian aircraft. Remotely operated vehicle equipment was relocated to where the noises were detected, but so far searches in those areas have not come through with any results. Apparently the crew heard banging sounds every 30 minutes, which some interpreted to be a signal of SOS. Though we don't know if those same noises have continued or what could have caused it. Despite fears that their oxygen supplies have run out, there is still hope in the most desperate of situations. Experts believe that the 96 hour supply number is an imprecise estimate and it could be extended if the people on board have taken measures to conserve their breathable air. You can do this by either lying still as possible or even sleeping. One of the passengers on board is the CEO of OceanGate Stockton Rush and the person who founded the company with him in 2009 is Guillermo Solane and he believes that the window for finding them could be a lot bigger than we think. He said, today will be a critical day in the search and rescue mission as the sub's life support supplies are starting to run low. I'm certain that Stockton and the rest of the crew realized days ago that the best thing they can do to ensure their rescue is to extend the limits of those supplies by relaxing as much as possible. I firmly believe that the time window available for their rescue is longer than what most people think. I continue to hold out hope for my friend and the rest of the crew. If that is true, conditions on board the vessel would be absolutely horrid. It's been said that the passengers were told not to eat before boarding the Titan and inside the vessel there is very limited rations of food and water. But the bigger issue would be the near freezing water at that depth which is probably making the situation very uncomfortable. After a while there will be frost that starts to develop on the inside of the sub. The men might be all huddled together trying to conserve their body heat but at the same time they know they're running low on oxygen and they're exhaling carbon dioxide. Even the fact that they're trapped inside a tiny 22 foot tube with a single window and no seats thousands of feet below the sea level would be enough to cause claustrophobia. At the moment experts believe there's very few options for what could have realistically happened. There's a slim chance that they could be floating on the surface of the water but even if that is the case the vessel can only be opened from the outside as it's fixed shut with 17 megabolts so the oxygen supply would still be a problem. It's also possible that they're stuck within the actual wreckage of the Titanic and in that case rescue would be very very difficult considering just how deep the site actually is. The third scenario is sadly implosion which would be instantaneous if the hull collapses under the enormous pressure. In that case the chances of survival are zero. So let's just hope that they are successful in these desperate times. Now let's talk about the rumor that killer whales were behind the Titan implosion. As we now know the search for the missing Titan submersible ended in tragedy. The US Coast Guard announced that they found debris which is consistent with a catastrophic implosion which is believed to have happened on Sunday morning. About an hour and 45 minutes into their descent in the Atlantic Ocean. The divers discovered the tail cone of the Titan submersible approximately 1,600 feet from the bow of the Titanic on the sea floor. Before the discovery was made there were all kinds of rumors swirling on social media as to what could have caused the vessel to go missing. At one point the idea that orcas could somehow be responsible was brought up given the fact that the pot of orcas off the Strait of Gibraltar have sunk three ships but experts warned that this was always a false theory and it's actually damaging the animal's reputation. Marine Mammal Research Unit Director Andrew Tides spoke to Newsweek about the rumors. He said that
said although orcas do live in the North Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Canada, they don't dive deeper than 100 meters into the ocean, whereas the wreckage of the Titanic is approximately 4,000 meters deep in the ocean. So he says that there is no way this population of killer whales could be involved with what's happened to the submersible. The accidental sinking of ships because of damage invoked by killer whales is unique to the orca pod off the coast of Spain and Portugal, though the population does not interact with other pods. So other pods would have to develop this action completely on their own, which is extremely unlikely. Also, submersibles are just made of different material to sailboats, given the extreme pressure that the vessel has to endure when it dives thousands of meters deep into the ocean. It would just be impossible for any animal to damage the exterior enough to sink it. The sailboats that were damaged are often made out of fiberglass, which is a very fragile material, so it's a lot easier to damage. Experts worry that this kind of speculation about killer whales is actually harming their reputation, the reputation of the whole species. Monica Whalen, the director of the Orca Behavior Institute, spoke to Newsweek and said that the media coverage on the orcas is bordering on unhinged, and it could result in people becoming afraid of the whales for no reason. She said, my concern is for the whales, and who outside of the small population near the Strait of Gibraltar have absolutely no interest in interacting with vessels of any type. So this theory has been completely debunked. As for the tragedy of the Titan, it's been reported that an implosion is certainly what caused the deaths of the five-person crew. This horrific accident resulted in the loss of British billionaire Hamish Harding, Pakistani billionaire Shahzada Dawood and his son Suleiman, French diver Paul Henry, and Ocean Gate CEO Stockton Rush. Leading the search was Rear Admiral John Morgan, who has now offered his condolences to the families and said that he hopes the discovery can bring them some solace during this difficult time. Moving on, there has been some more disturbing news about Amanda Bynes. Amanda was detained this weekend for a mental health evaluation about three months after she was placed on psychiatric hold. According to TMZ, the LAPD took her into custody Saturday morning after they received a call for a woman in distress. Eyewitnesses said that Amanda looked calm in the presence of the police. This incident comes after reports that she's been very diligent about her medication and focused on therapy. It's been said that she's living alone and tends to keep to herself. Back in March, it was reported that she was found roaming the streets naked and alone near downtown LA in the early hours of the morning. She was going through a psychotic episode and thankfully she was able to wave a car down and tell the driver to call 911. She was then taken to a nearby police station and placed on a 5150 psych hold while her mental health status was getting evaluated. At the time, no one exactly knew what happened to trigger this horrific event, although many signs pointed to a mental breakdown. Her ex-fiance Paul Michael later spoke to TMZ and explained that they were having relationship problems the week before, and they decided to break up. He claimed that two weeks before the incident, Amanda disappeared for three days and eventually came home with another guy. He said she seemed like a different person. They had an argument and Paul then packed up his things and left their home. Before returning to a psychiatric hospital, Amanda was spotted out on the streets of Hollywood on St. Patrick's Day. A TikTok user by the name of Caitlin Hotfox recognized her and filmed a video of them walking together. Thankfully, she was able to see that Amanda needed a bit of help and she seemed to be respectful of her state of mind. In the clip, Amanda was holding her arm and looking off into the distance. At one point, she smiles and waves to the camera before focusing her eyes on the street. She didn't say much in the video, but it looked like she was happy to have found someone to hang on to. The woman in that video left a comment saying, happy she's getting the help that she needs. She was sweet, gave her some money and talked. Sometimes people just need someone to talk to. Something similar was reported to have happened a few days before her psychotic episode. An eyewitness spoke to Entertainment Tonight and claimed that they had seen Amanda during the early hours of the morning. They said no one really recognized or noticed her. She was walking tensely and by herself. A woman started walking with her and tried to help her. Amanda asked the woman to hold her. She seemed to be in a loving, wholesome mood, even though she was clearly out of it. She asked to be dropped off at her friend's place in Beverly Hills, but when the woman went to drop her off, Amanda's friend did not answer the door. Apparently, she didn't want to go home because her boyfriend had kicked her out, so she then asked to be dropped back off on Hollywood Boulevard. As for her parents, they have made it very clear that they aren't considering another conservatorship, despite everything that's just happened. They believe it was a good sign that she was at least able to call the police on herself and had the ability to recognize when she needed help. A source then spoke to Entertainment Tonight and confirmed that Amanda and her fiance had broken up before that mental health crisis and hospitalization. They said Amanda broke things off with Paul in January and kicked him out of the house. She realized that ending their relationship would be best for her. Amanda is doing well and taking care of herself. Talking to ET at the time, Paul said she's doing well. I really love the experience that we got to share together and that we got to know each other, but there was nothing I could do. So let's just hope that Amanda does have the support close to her this time around so she can get 
get the help that she needs. And now doctors are warning about Ozempic's terrifying side effects. It's no doubt that it's become the hottest prescription on the market, and the trend seems to have started in Hollywood and spread from there. But the medication, which was initially designed for people with type 2 diabetes, can have serious side effects. It's been reported that doctors are now witnessing a spike in ER admissions among those who use it. One ER doctor took to Twitter and wrote, the amount of people coming to the ER for the side effects of Ozempic, diarrhea, nausea, bloating. Meanwhile, other medics are sounding the alarm about additional side effects like blurred vision, kidney failure, gallstones, and even cancer. While changes in vision is listed as a side effect on the official website, we still don't know whether it directly causes that symptom or whether diabetics who take the medication are experiencing something called retinopathy, which is an eye condition that can cause vision loss and blindness specifically in people who have diabetes. According to one UK website, diabetic patients are actually more likely to experience blurred vision while taking Ozempic because of the high sugar levels, which can damage the retina. But we're also hearing reports of the other unpleasant side effects, which seem to be a lot more common. On TikTok, the phrase Ozempic burp has 1.2 billion views, and many people are also complaining about their breath smelling like rotten eggs. Even celebrity users like Elon Musk have admitted that their burps are next level. This is because the medication slows the digestive system, which can lead to a buildup of air. The bad smell could be caused by stress, acid reflux, irritable bowel syndrome, and even a bacterial infection. In clinical trials, nearly 9% of patients reported belching as a side effect, while 6% reported acid reflux. The other side effects seem to be nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and of course, constipation. Ozempic patients have also talked about having bizarre dreams and excessive bowel movements, especially at night. Many of them quite literally reported defecating while sleeping. Of course, through all of this, your physical appearance will also go through some changes too. Many users have complained about something that they call a Zempic face, which is that gaunt, hollowed out look you get in your face once you've lost a significant amount of weight. This is mostly a loss of facial fat that can leave the face sagging and looking older. But some people on the medication feel that this facial change is extremely drastic. It's not just a wrinkle in one area or heaviness around the eyes. A Zempic face often means changes in your temples, jawline, mouth, and under eyes. This usually happens because patients have dropped too much weight and far too quickly. If that isn't crazy enough, there is also something called ozempic fingers, which is exactly what it sounds like. Apparently women have been flocking to jewelers to resize their wedding rings after dramatic weight loss has slimmed down their fingers. The biggest issue though is that people who want to use the medication just to lose a few pounds wouldn't normally be candidates for that treatment, but they want to get their hands on it anyway. And that's what's led to a shortage in the past. A few months ago, the FDA listed both Ozempic and Wagovi as two dozens of medications in short supply. A representative for the manufacturer released a statement saying that they are experiencing intermittent supply disruptions due to the incredible demand. It's currently being supplied by doctors and nutritionists. It's also being said that certain medical spas carry it as well. And of course, it's not cheap. A single Ozempic pen costs somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 per month if you're getting it from a pharmacist. But the real question is, are people going to be lining up for it even though we're still finding out about the side effects? Or are the risks actually worth the potential benefits of weight loss? Well, that's something that still needs to be discussed. All right, so this Colleen Ballinger drama just keeps getting worse. There's so much that's been coming out about this controversy, it's insane. So two weeks ago, she was accused of inappropriate behavior towards her young fans of Miranda Sings. She was specifically called out by a guy named Adam McIntyre who shared a video exposing the inappropriate relationship that he had with her when he was and she was in her 30s. And it turns out that Adam isn't the only one speaking out against her. A TikTok was posted on June 14th by a young woman named Becky, who alleged that Colleen routinely humiliated and exploited her underage fans for entertainment in her shows. Becky opened up about how she went to one of her shows when she was 16 years old, and she was called up on stage to be a part of it. But she soon got very uncomfortable when they started something called the Yoga Challenge, which involved Colleen controlling her body for the audience's amusement. Becky posted actual footage from the show and it's really quite horrible. She said that even though she wasn't wearing pants, that didn't stop Colleen from continuing. She said, in fact, no adult at any point stepped in in this situation. And the moment she'll never forget is when she was lying under Colleen while she was smirking down at her while thousands of people were laughing. She said, I was terrified my body wasn't covered up enough. It felt incredibly violating. I was younger, my body was still developing. For her to use my body as entertainment on stage really set my confidence back quite a lot. Becky says she doesn't consider 
wanted the experience to be SA, but it did make her feel nasty and gross, like she wanted to purge and clean out her insides. So of course, it seems like it was a really horrible moment for her. Other former fans of Miranda Sings have also come forward about their experiences attending her live shows when they were teenagers, and they said they felt very uncomfortable at the time. In a TikTok video posted just yesterday, a creator by the name of Grapes shared a video of Colleen repeatedly sexualizing her outfit on stage. Basically, she put on a hat and she whacked her chest area. The whole thing was really strange and it didn't make a lot of sense as to why she would be doing that with someone so young. Another fan came forward claiming that they no longer support her after realizing that they were in a group chat created by her with young fans. Cody Tyler, a content creator and founder of the YouTube channel Cody Rants, was a longtime fan of Miranda Sings for years. They grew close with her and her family, and in a now deleted YouTube video called Why I Left the Colleen Bollinger Fandom, Cody revealed that they were added to one of her group chats that consisted of very, very young fans. Although they were an adult at the time, they were reportedly unaware of all the others in the online chat, and they've since issued an apology. Cody also shared screenshots of Colleen asking fans inappropriate questions, like trying to find out whether or not they've had any sexual experiences. For his part, Adam McIntyre seems to be leading these allegations. He claimed that the YouTuber would use love bombing to make him feel special praising him and encouraging him to run her social media accounts without pay or accreditation. Later on, she also seemed to manipulate and bully him into doing free labor. Adam first connected with her when he was 13 and she was in her 30s. They met during a live stream that she was hosting with her friend in 2016. She noticed Adam's tweets and said that he was so funny that she just had to send him something. Then she sent him lingerie in the mail, which his mother confiscated immediately. They allegedly continued to have a friendship and she even asked him out to lunch while she was in Ireland which is where he lives. This relationship continued for some years until Adam posted something on her Twitter account which received quite a lot of backlash. At the moment, he's still coming through with more evidence of all these allegations, and he even started his own drama channel in the midst of it all. So be sure to check out those videos as this scandal unfolds. And now, did you see the moment that Ava Max got attacked on stage? Less than 24 hours after BB Rexa was hit in the face by a fan who tossed a cell phone during her show, Ava Max was slapped by a man during her concert on Tuesday. Tuesday night. A video from the incident went viral on social media, and it shows a man dressed in black storming the stage and reaching out in what looks like an attempt to touch Ava before getting wrapped up by security and hauled away after brushing her face with his hand. A fan at the show described the wild scene on Twitter and wrote, This guy rushed the stage at the end, right? When the last song ended. The security guard tackled him and literally threw him down the stairs. Wild. It happened so fast. You can see here that she couldn't even open her eyes, but she still did MNG. For her part, Ava took to Twitter and wrote, He slapped me so hard that he scratched the inside of my eye. He's never coming to a show again. Thank you to the fans for being spectacular tonight in LA though. This incident took place less than 48 hours after BB Rexa was attacked on stage. She was taken to a New York hospital when 27-year-old Nicholas Malbana threw his cell phone at her face during one of her live shows at the rooftop at PS17. The fan was then arrested and charged for the incident, and BB had to get stitches above her eye as a result of the phone strike. The question is, why are female musicians being attacked by men at their own shows? For most of us, concerts are about enjoying live music from our favorite artists. And while many can relate to the excitement of seeing our most loved musicians in person, drawing potentially dangerous items on stage or straight up attacking people crosses a very clear boundary. No matter how famous they are, musicians deserve to be safe and protected, just like the rest of us. And just because they're opening themselves up to massive crowds, their personal space and privacy isn't up for grabs more than anyone else's. Fans have since taken to Twitter to share their thoughts over the recent events. One person wrote, Someone jumped on stage and slapped Ava Max last night. Someone threw a phone at BB Rex's head. Can we effing respect performers when they're working, please? Also, when they're not working, just respect them in general and not attack them. Another person wrote, Leaving your house to attack a woman at her own concert is evil. It's wild that BB Rexa and Ava Max were both attacked in such a short period of time by two different men. Clearly, people are shocked and angry at this recent uptake in violence against female performers, and they're confused as to why it's even happening in the first place. Of course, it's not just women who are affected. Back in November, Harry Styles was injured after a fan threw hard candy onto the stage. 
stage. He was performing the song Kiwi at the Kia Forum in LA, and then he was pelted with a shower of Skittles, some of which hit his eye. A video of the moment was then shared to Twitter, and the footage shows multiple pieces of candy zooming across the stage before one piece hits Harry directly in his left eye. In the clip, he immediately winces and holds his hand up to his eye, bowing his head towards the floor. As he turns towards the camera, he is visibly squinting, and it seems like he couldn't open his eye for the rest of the show. Harry was later filmed driving himself home from the venue, where he appeared to be rubbing his injured eye. So obviously there was some real damage done. And just months before that, musician Steve Lacey had to cut his New Orleans gig short after a fan threw a literal disposable camera at him. He then smashed the fan's camera and walked off stage saying, don't throw crap on my effing stage. Also, early last year, Louis Thomason was the target of a crazy concert goer during a show in New York when someone threw a literal chicken nugget which hit him on the head. He shouted, who has hit me in the head with an effing chicken nugget? He then threw the chicken nugget back into the crowd. All hell broke loose on Tuesday when Taylor Swift announced international tour dates for her Eras tour in Latin America, Europe, Asia and Australia. And who did she leave out? Well, of course it was Canada and it caused an uproar. The decision resulted in the hashtag cries in Canadian trending on Twitter and fans started posting about how disappointed they were with the announcement. But people are not just sad, they're also angry. Now federal lawmakers are stepping in. On Wednesday, there was an official grievance filed with the House of Commons by conservative Alberta MP Matt Genereau. In the letter he wrote, it has come to my attention that despite much anticipation, Taylor Swift's Eras tour has neglected to include any Canadian dates or locations as she released her international dates, which includes stops throughout Asia and Europe. The MP said that he was filing the grievance on behalf of all Canadian Swifties and asking Taylor to reconsider. He said, not only is this leaving Canadian fans without the opportunity to see her tour, but it's also leaving Canada out of the economic opportunities that her shows generate. He mentioned the fact that Taylor's shows are estimated to generate about $4.6 billion for local economies. Because fans don't just attend concerts, they spend money at local businesses, including hotels, restaurants, and shops. He ended the letter by saying, this motion is nonpartisan in nature and requires swift action to address what I can only assume is a serious oversight. In fact, the motion received support from both sides of the house. The Eras tour is Taylor's sixth world tour and her only one to admit any stops in Canada. Her last performance in Canada was all the way back in August of 2018, when she stopped in Toronto for her Reputation Stadium tour. So it's no wonder that fans had so much anticipation and hope that she would return. On Tuesday, she unveiled a list of international shows in 2024, including Europe, Asia, and Australia. After a break in December and January, January, the tour will pick back up again in Tokyo, Japan, and it will follow with stops in major cities like Melbourne, Australia, Sydney, Australia, Singapore, Paris, Stockholm, and Sweden. Then she'll wrap up the tour with two final shows in London in August of 2024. Taylor is currently halfway through the US dates of her tour, and it will continue this weekend with two shows in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The only thing that seems to be a recurring issue for fans is their dealings with Ticketmaster. In fact, the ticket sale website has proven to be a disaster in the month since the tour was announced. This problem is so widespread that it even led to a Brazilian lawmaker introducing a bill which is nicknamed the Taylor Swift Law. It's supposed to stop scalpers that make buying legal tickets for her show nearly impossible. Taylor is playing three shows in Sao Paulo, which is where a bill was introduced that would criminalize ticket scalping with penalties of up to four years in prison and fees of up to 100 times the original ticket price. Tickets for the Latin American branch of the Eras Tour have generated so much excitement and chaos that online scalpers have overwhelmed servers and pushed real fans to the end of the queues. There are even in-person scalpers who are known to get violent in an attempt to buy tickets for resale. This was also a major issue back in January when over 3.5 million people registered to get a pre-sale code from Ticketmaster's verified fan system, but only 1.5 million fans were sent codes to access the pre-sale. The company then said that due to bot attacks as well as fans who didn't have codes, they reported that 3.5 billion total system requests were recorded during that pre-sale. As a result, fans were stuck for hours and the website itself was frozen or it kept crashing at checkout. In the end, 2.4 million tickets were sold during the pre-sale alone. Ticketmaster later cancelled the general sale due to what they called insufficient remaining ticket inventory to meet the demand. Essentially, the verified fan system is meant to ensure that fans get their hands on tickets before bots and resellers do. But shortly after the pre-sale, tickets began popping up on ticket resale websites for ridiculous amounts of money. Sadly, fans were either faced with paying thousands of dollars more for a ticket or missing out on the opportunity to see their favorite artists perform. It was just such a mess no matter which way you look
looked at it. All right, now it looks like Nicki Minaj's neighbors are trying to kick her out of the Hidden Hills. There's a petition circulating online from Hidden Hills residents worried about Nicki and her husband, Kenneth Petty, moving into the fancy neighborhood. And hundreds of them have apparently signed it, hoping to keep them out. The petition was started by a resident named Beverly Barton. And it takes issue with the fact that Kenneth is a registered offender, considering the fact that he was convicted of attempted SA back in 1995, in a case that landed him in prison for more than four years. He recently filed new legal documents changing his address on the Megan's Law website. So that's most likely when the neighbors took notice. Nikki and Kenneth bought a mansion in Hidden Hills back in December. Although Kenneth is currently serving one year of home detention for failing to register as an offender in California. The residents seem to be concerned about more than just their safety though. It's been suggested that the mere presence of him in the community would hurt their property values and would affect the general feel of the area. So there is clearly a strong pushback to the idea of him moving in, despite the fact that they've already bought the $19.5 million home. The petition says Kenneth Petty is a level three offender and has a high likelihood of reoffending. He was also found guilty for killing a man. The Petty couple moving in would lead to the appraisal of our homes going down due to safety concerns. It would lead to children and women being a target. We, the residents of Hidden Hills, must put our resident safety first. Don't wait to receive a letter from the government saying that a predator has moved in near you. Do not allow this dangerous offender to live near you. This situation is just the latest example of how controversial Nikki and Kenneth's relationship has proven to be. Because of his criminal past, Nikki has had to defend him from criticism numerous times. In August, the couple were sued by Jennifer Hugh, the woman he was convicted of attempting to SA. She filed a lawsuit against the two of them, accusing them of continually targeting her to try to make her take back her claims. Apparently, Nikki called several times to speak with her about recanting the story, and she received numerous phone calls and unexpected visits from individuals associated with the couple. At one point, even Nikki's publicist was in talks to pay her a visit in order to discuss her statement. The lawsuit states that Jennifer has not worked since May of 2020 due to severe depression, paranoia, constant moving, and threats from the defendants and their associates. She's currently living in isolation out of fear of retaliation. She's since claimed that her life has been uprooted by Nikki and Kenneth, and most of this goes back years. She opened up about the life-altering backlash she received when she decided to step forward and share her account of the incident. The constant intimidation and targeting led her to live a life of secrecy and privacy. She claimed that the couple even offered her upwards of $500,000 to take back these claims. But but she refused. Over a year ago, Nikki announced that she was officially married to Kenneth Petty. The rapper excitedly shared the news with her fans on the popular show Queen Radio. The pair had allegedly been dating since 2018. In several interviews around that same time, Nikki alluded to the fact that she'd been dreaming of her wedding day since she was a child. By the time she announced her marriage though, fans already knew that Kenneth was a registered offender. And that's when the backlash began. At one point in 2019, she responded to the controversy that she received for marrying him. By declaring her husband had been wrongfully accused of attempted SA at the age of 15. She also claimed that Jennifer had written a letter to the judge in 1995 requesting to recant her statement. According to Nikki, when Jennifer figured out that he would go to jail for 90 days, she decided not to recant her statement. Nikki has been defending him for their entire relationship. In December of 2018, after receiving backlash from fans on social media, she stood up for him in her Instagram comments. When speaking about the charges of SA, she said he was 15 she was 16 in a relationship, but go off internet. Then in a 2019 episode of Queen Radio, she said, when you're someone's wife, you've got to be more prayed up because you've got to cover your husband in prayer. This was a direct response to the criticism that was raised after Nikki announced that she had married him. In November that same year, Wendy Williams spoke about their relationship and said that Nikki should never have married him because now she's ruined everything about what her brand could be. She then directed her staff to get digging into his illegal history and said, there's more on him him, everybody get to digging. Nikki responded via Queen Radio and said, I didn't know that in our society you have to be plagued by your past. I didn't know that people can't turn over a new leaf. I didn't know that your viciousness and evilness was this deep rooted. She also accused Wendy of reporting on his past with evil intentions and claimed that she wasn't just trying to do her job.